The Man with the Twisted Lip, A Sherlock Holmes Mystery, by Arthur Conan Doyle, Part 3. Sherlock Holmes and his friend John Watson are on their way to the country residence of Neville St. Clair, who has disappeared in London in bizarre circumstances. I confess that I cannot recall any case within my experience which looked at first glance so simple and yet presented such difficulties. While Sherlock Holmes had been detailing this singular series of events, we had been whirling through the outskirts of the great town until the last straggling houses had been left behind, and we rattled along with a country hedge upon either side of us. Just as he finished, however, we drove through two scattered villages where a few lights still glimmered in the windows. We are on the outskirts of Lee, said my companion. We have touched on three English counties in our short drive, starting in Middlesex, passing over an angle of Surrey, and ending in Kent. See that light among the trees? That is the cedars, and beside that lamp sits an anxious woman whose anxious ears have already, I have little doubt, caught the clink of our horse's feet. But why are you not conducting the case on Baker Street? I asked. Because there are many inquiries which must be made out here. Mrs. Sinclair has most kindly put two rooms at my disposal, and you may rest assured that she will have nothing but a welcome for my friend and colleague. I hate to meet her, Watson, when I have no news of her husband. Here we are. Whoa! Whoa there! We had pulled up in front of a large villa which stood within its own grounds. A stable boy had run out to the horse's head, and springing down I followed Holmes up the small, winding gravel drive which led to the house. As we approached, the door flew open, and a little blonde woman stood in the opening, clad in some sort of light mousselin de soie, with a touch of fluffy pink chiffon at her neck and wrists. She stood with her figure outlined against the flood of light, one hand upon the door, one half raised in her eagerness, her body slightly bent, her head and face protruded, with the eager eyes and parted lips, a standing question. Well? she cried. Well? And then seeing that there were two of us, she gave a cry of hope, which sank into a groan as she saw that my companion shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. No good news? None. No bad? No. Thank God for that. But come in, you must be weary, for you have had a long day. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. He has been of most vital use to me in several of my cases, and a lucky chance has made it possible for me to bring him out and associate him with this investigation. I am delighted to see you, said she, pressing my hand warmly. You will, I am sure, forgive anything that may be wanting in our arrangements when you consider the blow which has come so suddenly upon us. My dear madam, said I, I am an old campaigner, and if I were not I can very well see that no apology is needed. If I can be of any assistance, either to you or to my friend here, I shall be indeed happy. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said the lady as we entered a well-lit dining room upon the table of which a cold supper had been laid out, I should very much like to ask you one or two plain questions, to which I beg that you will give a plain answer. Certainly, madam. Do not trouble about my feelings. I am not hysterical nor given to fainting. I simply wish to hear your real, real opinion. Upon what point? In your heart of hearts, do you think that Neville is alive? Sherlock Holmes seemed to be embarrassed by the question. Frankly now, she repeated, standing upon the rug and looking keenly down at him as he leaned back in a basket chair. Frankly then, madam, I do not. You think that he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say that. Perhaps. And... On what day did he meet his death? On Monday. Then perhaps, Mr. Holmes, you will be good enough to explain how it is that I have received a letter from him today. Sherlock Holmes sprang out of his chair as if he had been galvanised. What? he roared. She stood smiling, holding up a little slip of paper in the air. May I see it? Certainly. He snatched it from her in his eagerness, and smoothing it out upon the table, he drew over the lamp and examined it intently. I had left my chair and was gazing at it over his shoulder. The envelope was a very coarse one and was stamped with the Gravesend postmark and with the date of that very day, or rather of the day before, for it was considerably after midnight. Coarse writing, murmured Holmes. Surely this is not your husband's writing, madam? 
No, but the enclosure is. I perceive also that whoever addressed the envelope had to go and inquire as to the address. How can you tell that? The name you see is in perfect black ink, which has dried itself. The rest is of the greyish colour which shows that blotting paper had been used. If it had been written straight off and then blotted, none would be of a deep black shade. This man has written the name, and there has been a pause before he wrote the address, which can only mean that he was not familiar with it. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Let us now see the letter. Ha! There has been an enclosure here. Yes, there was a ring, his signet ring. And you are sure that this is your husband's hand? One of his hands. One? His hand when he wrote hurriedly. It is very unlike his usual writing, and yet I know it well. Dearest, do not be frightened. All will come well. There is a huge error which it may take some little time to rectify. Wait in patience. Neville. Written in pencil upon the fly-leaf of a book. Octavo size, no watermark. Hm. Posted today in Gravesend by a man with a dirty thumb. Ah! And the flap has been gummed, if I am not very much in error, by a person who has been chewing tobacco. And you have no doubt that it is your husband's hand, madam? None. Neville wrote those words. And they were posted today at Gravesend. Well, Mrs. Sinclair, the clouds lighten, though I should not venture to say that the danger is over. But he must be alive, Mr. Holmes. Unless there is clever forgery to put us on the wrong scent... The ring, after all, proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. No, it is his very own writing. Very well. It may, however, have been written on Monday and only posted today. That is possible. If so, much may have happened between. Oh, you must not discourage me, Mr. Holmes. I know that all is well with him. There is so keen a sympathy between us that I should know if evil came upon him. On the very day that I saw him last, he cut himself in the bedroom, and yet I, in the dining room, rushed upstairs instantly with the utmost certainty that something had happened. Do you think that I would respond to such a trifle, and yet be ignorant of his death? I have seen too much not to know that the impression of a woman may be more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner. And in this letter you certainly have a very strong piece of evidence to corroborate your view. But if your husband is alive and able to write letters, why should he remain away from you? I cannot imagine. It is unthinkable. And on Monday he made no remarks before leaving you? No. And you were surprised to see him in Swandham Lane? Very much so. Was the window open? Yes. Then he might have called to you. He might. He only, as I understand, gave an inarticulate cry. Yes. And a call for help, you thought. Yes, he waved his hands. But it might have been a cry of surprise. Astonishment at the unexpected sight of you might cause him to throw up his hands. It is possible. And you thought he was pulled back. He disappeared so suddenly. He might have leapt back. You did not see anyone else in the room. No, but this horrible man confessed to having been there, and the Lasker was at the foot of the stairs. Quite so. Your husband, as far as you could see, had his ordinary clothes on. But without his collar or tie, I distinctly saw his bare throat. Had he ever spoken of Swandham Lane? Never. Had he ever shown any signs of having taken opium? Never. Thank you, Mrs. Sinclair. Those are the principal points about which I wish to be absolutely clear. We shall now have a little supper, and then retire, for we may have a very busy day tomorrow. A large and comfortable double-bedded room had been placed at our disposal, and I was quickly between the sheets, for I was weary after my night of adventure. Sherlock Holmes was a man, however, who, when he had an unsolved problem upon his mind, would go for days, and even for a week, without rest, turning it over, rearranging his facts, looking at it from every point of view, until he had either fathomed it, or convinced himself that his data was insufficient. It was soon evident to me that he was now preparing for an all-night sitting. He took off his coat and waistcoat, put on a large blue dressing gown, and then wandered about the room, collecting pillows from his bed and cushions from the sofa and armchairs. With these he constructed a sort of eastern divan upon which he perched himself cross-legged with an ounce of shag tobacco and a box of matches laid out in front of him. In the dim light of the lamp I saw him sitting there, an old briar pipe between his lips, his eyes focused vacantly upon the corner of the ceiling, the blue smoke curling up from him, silent, motionless, with the light shining upon his strong set, aquiline features. So he sat as I dropped off to sleep, 
and so he sat when a sudden ejaculation caused me to wake up, and I found the summer sun shining into the apartment. The pipe was still between his lips, the smoke still curled upward, and the room was full of a dense tobacco haze, but nothing remained of the heap of shag which I had seen upon the previous night. "'Awake, Watson?' he asked. "'Yes.' "'Game for a morning drive?' "'Certainly. "'Then dress. No one is stirring yet, but I know where the stable boy sleeps, and we shall soon have the trap out.' He chuckled to himself as he spoke, his eyes twinkled, and he seemed a different man to the sombre thinker of the previous night. As I dressed, I glanced at my watch. It was no wonder that no one was stirring. It was twenty-five minutes past four. I had hardly finished when Holmes returned with the news that the boy was putting in the horse. "'I want to test a little theory of mine,' said he, pulling on his boots. "'I think, Watson, that you are now standing in the presence of one of the most absolute fools in Europe.' I deserve to be kicked from here to Charing Cross, but I think I have the key of the affair now. And where is it? I asked, smiling. In the bathroom, he answered. Oh yes, I am not joking, he continued, seeing my look of incredulity. I have just been there, and I have taken it out, and I have got it in this Gladstone bag. Come on, my boy, and we shall see whether it will not fit the lock.' <laughs>